Hi and welcome back. This is video 2 of 2 for chapter 11. Now chapter 11, remember, introduces, introduces us to the concept of magnetic force. And in this video what I'd like to do is to continue along uh, with looking at the force. Specifically I would like to start with a situation where you have current flowing through a wire that's in the presence of a magnetic field. So here uh, I want you to imagine current current flowing through in this direction right here. So this would be the direction of current flow right here. And then maybe there's a magnetic field sitting around. I don't know. We'll have it pass through like this. So here's your magnetic field right here. Okay. So if I were to, um, you know, draw a coordinate system here, uh, just to give us a little bit of a perspective. Uh, let's see, let's do this right here. We'll call this the y axis, we'll call this the x axis, just out of convenience. Uh, your current as it flows through this wire is, throwing, is flowing down x. And, you know, B is going to cut across like this, making an angle with respect to the direction of the current flow um, and the magnetic field here of, of what I'll call theta. Now, if you remember, um, you know, some time ago uh, when we were talking about current, uh, we talked about drift velocity. So um, there's a relationship between the flow of current, the charge of the charge carriers, um, the density, uh, of the, the charge carriers per unit volume, um, the area, the cross-sectional area that is flowing through, and the drift velocity. And if you remember, um, the direction is in part defined by the drift velocity here and also, you know, the, the charge on the charge carrier. So, that said, uh, I want you to imagine these charges as they flow through. Okay, so here are our little charges right here making their way through um, with a velocity of we'll say v sub d which uh, in this case uh, we'll say is in the conventional direction along the x-axis. So if you think about the magnetic force it looks like this uh, q v cross b. Now I'm going to make the assumption right now that our magnetic field is uniform. It's constant. Now there are going to be many cases in which the magnetic field isn't, but it's uh, much more convenient to us at this point to talk about uniform constant magnetic fields. So if I were to take the differential of this, df, um, and, and think of uh, the velocity as being something that um, is more or less constant, thinking of the magnetic field as being something at least at, the, at this point, something more or less constant, then really the only thing that, that changes as um, you know we look at these things as they pass through this wire would be the charge. So this would be the same thing as dq times v cross b. Now, so what's dq here? Well, I'd like to pick a little segment of length. And as drawn, um, we're going to call this little segment right here dl. Um, if you were to you know do calculus on this, uh, the direction of integration would be, you know, along the x-axis. So it would be, you know, down the x-hat. So, you know, that said, um, dq here is the number of charges that sit within our little little segment that we're just looking at. All right. So what are the number of charges? Or at least it's the charge in there. So uh, q, again, would be the charge on each one of these. Uh, the number of charges depends upon the volume here. So what's that volume going to be? Well, um, it's going to be the area, the cross-sectional area, times uh, dl, which would be the length right here. Now, um, so we still need to get the number of charges that would be sitting in here passing through carrying current. And that comes from, you know, our uh, charge carrier density n. Now, if I massage this, uh, you know, just a little bit, then what you have here is a q n times A times DL. Now we're going to think of DL as part of a vector and that 
Um, if you if you look at the direction of the current flow here, the direction of the drift, V sub D, and you look at the direction of DL as something that you would integrate over, it's the same. So what we're going to do is to take the vector characteristic of V sub D and put it into DL here since they both point in the same direction. So what that means is, is that if I were to write my df here as dq v sub d cross b for the drift, then I can massage this such that it looks like this. Okay, so this would be df. Now if you look here, Q times N times A times V sub D, this is just the current. Okay, so um, DF you could think of as I times DL. Now DL is in the direction of conventional current flow. That's something that you need to sort of put a star beside in your notes and remember. Um, you know, cross B. And in situations where, um, you know, everything is nice and regular, when you do this integral, nothing on the right-hand side really changes, with the exception of, you know, dl. So if you were to consider a length, we'll say L, of this conductor, then the force along that length would be I times L vector cross B. Now remember, this points in the direction of the current flow, the conventional current flow. And it's just how much of the conductor that you're interested in. Okay. So, so that said, a lot of times what we do is we look for the force per unit length. And as an example, so now let's take a look at this problem right here. Um, we have a power line that carries 2,000 amperes of current. And it sits in the presence of the Earth's magnetic field, which has a strength of about a little bit better than half of Gauss. Um, now this field passes through uh, the power line with an angle of 25 degrees with respect to the wire's direction. So we think of this as the wire's direction right here. Okay, uh, I'm going to let current flow this way uh, just out of convenience to pick a direction. So uh, this would be the direction of the L vector. Okay, and uh, we'll say the Earth's uh, magnetic field is penetrating the ground. It's passing through like this. Um, you know, the Earth's magnetic field varies in strength anywhere from about eh, like a quarter of a gauss to something like 0.65 or so gauss. Um, so here's our angle theta, which we've been given as 25 degrees. This would be our magnetic field B right here. Now B is 0 0.55 gauss. Um, in magnitude, that makes it 0 0.55 times 10 to the minus fourth Tesla. So as you can see, you know, the, the Gauss is something that fits like terrestrial magnetic fields very well. That's the reason why we use it. So um, the amount of current that we have flowing through our wire is uh, 2,000 amps, all right? So what we've been given is the following. Current is 2,000 amps. The strength of the magnetic field is 0 0.55 times 10 to the minus fourth Tesla. And the angle between the conventional direction of current flow and the magnetic field is 25 degrees. Now what we want to find here is the force per unit length on this wire. So how do we do that? Well, um, you know, uh, on the previous page I wrote down that uh, you know the force here for uh, a uniform magnetic field and a constant current is going to look like this and that's what we're dealing with right now and most of our situations are going to be like that so uh, the force looks like I L cross B now we don't have explicit directions we could break up our coordinate systems here and you know go through the the trouble of uh, finding unit vectors and uh, lengths of sides and what have you and you know do our, our cross product very technically or we could just note the fact that one version of the cross product has us finding the magnitude 
of the force and then using the right hand rule to find direction. Now we can use the right hand rule to find direction from the beginning. So if you look here it's it's I times L cross B. So if you remember the picture that we had done in the previous video we used to you know to for the right hand rule if you take and you put your pointer finger in direction of L and you stick your middle finger in the direction of B what you'll find is that your thumb is into the screen so if we were to draw a simple coordinate system uh, we'll just say where this little segment uh, centered on where this little segment of the magnetic field passes through like that and uh, what I'll do is I'll call this the y-axis and this the x-axis so what that does is make that the z-axis um, let's see uh, x cross y z would be out of the screen like this would be the z direction and if I if I put my pointer finger in the direction of L and again put my middle finger in the direction of where B is my thumb is, is into the screen meaning that at the end of the day the force itself is going to be in the minus z hat direction this would be its magnitude and this would be its direction right here so so our force really is a minus ILB sine theta z hat uh, I is 2000 amps B is 0 0.55 times 10 to the minus fourth Tesla L is something that we don't know we're gonna see what we're gonna do with that here in a moment sine of 25 degrees and then Z hat now if we divide the L through and we put this over here on the left hand side what you have is the force per unit length so that's what we're trying to find now plug everything else into the calculator I get minus 4 times sine of 25 um, 0 0.046 about newtons per meter down the negative z-axis. So what that means is, is anytime you have current flowing um, in the presence of a magnetic field, if uh, the magnetic field cuts across it like this and is not just simply parallel to the direction of current flow, you will have a force that's generated. So here what this means is, is that for every meter of this this line it's experiencing, you know, 0 0.046 uh, newtons which is not that much but you know it can add up over long distances and if you have much stronger current flow through it could be significant now so that said um, what I'd like to talk about next is some of the ramifications of that force specifically um, torque now I'd like to remind you from University of Physics 1 that torque itself is R cross F okay so I want you to imagine a loop of wire that's in the presence of a magnetic field and maybe this loop of wire has current flowing through it so here's our loop um, it's sitting in a uniform magnetic field we're going to assume that the current that's going through it is constant as well and uh, what we have is a front and a side view. Now, um, as I mentioned in the previous video, uh, when you deal with things like cross products, it's convenient to uh, deal with three-dimensional coordinate systems because that's really the only way you can go. And uh, so what I've done to help us sort of uh, get a view uh, or a little bit of better understanding of, as to what, what's going on is um, I've drawn these views. Specifically, you have Z being the up and down. So here's Z here in the front view and here's Z here in the side view. Now if you uh, use a conventional um, 
coordinate system here, what that does is to cause the x direction to be to the left, okay, um, in the front view. And if you rotate that to the side, uh, what that does is to make x come out. Um, in this right here, uh, b is straight down the y-axis. So uh, to the right here is the y-axis. Okay, so we have a front view and a side view of this loop. Now, that said, um, what I've done is to draw the direction of the current flow. So the current's going to go like this around the circuit, okay, counterclockwise. When you rotate to that to the side, what that does is to give this side right here, this is what we would be seeing as the side view. Right here, this would be the direction of the L on this side, and at the very bottom it goes in. So at the very bottom, I've drawn a little circle with an X there showing that this is the direction of current flow there. And then it goes around. On the back side, it's coming up, and then it comes out uh, at the very top. Okay, so it's going around like that. So what I'd like to do is to look at the force that's going to affect all of the sides. Um, and to help make that a little bit easier to look at, what we're going to do is we're going to do this on a side by side basis, starting with the one that we can see directly as number one. And we have a number two over here. We have a number three here. And we have a number four at the very top. Okay. So if we start with number one, and we look at the equation for force with respect to current, the direction of conventional current flow, and the magnetic field is present. Here, you would have an L that goes this way, a B that goes this way. So our angle in this particular situation would be right here. That's the angle between L and B. I'm going to call this theta 1. All right. Now, what we're going to do is to use um, this form right here of the equation and then use the right-hand rule to help us figure out uh, directions. So if I look at the front view part, if I take my right hand and I put my pointer finger in the direction of L, which is straight down, and then rotate my middle finger so that it's pointing straight out of the screen. My thumb is to the left, and to the left in the front view is along the positive x direction. So for the first force, which is, would be I times L1 cross B, since that's really the only thing that changes from side to side, it would be I times L, since this is an L by L loop, B sine theta 1 x hat. Okay, so what that does is to tell us that our force here, F1, is to the left. Now, on the right hand side, number 3. I'd like to do the same thing. We'll do two and four in a moment. It's going to be I times L3 cross B. And in this case, um, I is straight up as opposed to straight down. So if you were to take your pointer finger and put it in the direction of L or I, Turn your thumb, or rather, uh, turn your hand so that your middle finger points, uh, you know, out of the screen. Your thumb points to the right. So, this is the direction. The angle is the same, it's just going up. Now, um, the, uh, the direction here is down the negative x, uh, x hat direction. So what that means is, is that our force looks the same, it just has a minus sign in front.
Uh, I'm going to call this theta 1 since it's the same angle. It's just like I said, going up instead of going down now. There you go. Sorry, getting off to the edge of the writing tablet there. Okay, so um, so now let's talk about uh, two and four. So uh, if you see here, um, two and four um, are a, a little more complicated um, in that here, uh, two points straight down negative x and b points straight down y. So if you were to take, again, your pointer finger and point it in the direction of negative x and then rotate your hand so that um, your, your middle finger is pointing out of the screen. It makes it a little bit funny. Then what you end up with is a force that is straight down z. Okay. So again, uh, you can do it that way, or you can take and you can use the open hand approach, which is actually the one that I prefer. You put your fingers in the direction of L. You rotate your hand so you can close your palm towards B, and your thumb is down. So down here is straight down the Z axis, or minus Z. Okay, so for F2, we know it's going to be down the minus z hat direction. Now let's talk about angles. Because take a look here. Unlike the side parts, where you have the angle between the magnetic field and L being complicated, here, going in and out, it's not complicated at all. It's a right angle. Okay, so this is coming straight, uh, you know, out of the screen towards us in the x-hat direction, b here is straight down the y-hat direction, and x cross y is z. Okay, so so here uh, we don't have a sine part that we have to worry about, and that's because uh, you know when you look at the angle here it being 90 degrees, uh, you know the sine of 90 degrees is one. So for both f2 and f4. Um, we're going to have the same form, we're just going to have different signs. So with F2, which is the bottom one, it's just I times L times B. For F4, which is the top one, when you put your fingers in the direction of L and close them towards B, you end up with a force that goes up the x-axis. Okay, so there are four forces. Out, out, up, and down. Basically trying to pull this loop apart. Now let's talk about the torque. Okay, so um, here uh, the forces are going to balance each other out, as you can see, causing a net force of zero. But the torque is not zero. Um, and we're going to see why here in a moment. So um, let me rearrange these and just sort of group them in uh, one place. Well, actually, I'll tell you what. Let me just rewrite them. It's easy enough. I'll put them over here. Um, F1 is ILB sine theta 1 x hat. F2 is minus ILB Z hat. F3 is minus ILB sine of theta 1 x hat. And F4 is ILB Z hat. Now I'm going to clear my work area here. Okay, so talking about the torque, what I'd like to do is to take the side view and put the forces that we have acting on this thing. 
So this right here would be f4. This right here would be f2. And in and out of the screen along the x direction would be f1 and 3. So let me label these. I'll say F1 and F3. So this thing, when it rotates, since it's freely suspended in this magnetic field, is going to rotate by the center of mass. And we're going to use that as the origin of our um, coordinate system when we draw a torque diagram. So um, here's our torque diagram right here, centered on the very center of our loop. Um, I'm going to use the same coordinates here, Z and Y. Now remember the loop is an L by L loop. So what that means is, is that just considering for the moment F2 and F4, since those are the side view ones that we can see, what we have is a distance of one half L to where F4 is being applied. And then we have a distance of one half L is it about right. No, it's gonna be about there. One half L to where F2 is being applied. So let's label this. I'm going to call this um, R4. Uh, and this right here, R2. This is F2. And this is F4. Now finding torque means that generally you're talking about this angle right here. It's the angle between R and F. And in both cases the angle is the same. I'm just going to call this theta for the moment. Now we're going to come back and we're going to address the effects of 1 and 3 here in a second. Um, so, so what you have here if you just think about these two torques, I'll start with the torque on two, tau 2. That would be R2 cross F2. All right. Now, in magnitude, tau 2 would look like the magnitude of R2, the magnitude of F2, times sine of the angle in between. Okay, so, so now let's talk about direction. Um, if you take and you put your uh, pointer finger in the direction of R, this is R2, which would be straight down uh, to the left, and then you put your middle finger in the direction of F2, or you could also also uh, put, your, put your fingers in the direction of, of R, and then close them towards F2. What you end up with is a thumb that's out of the screen. Now out of the screen is along the X hat direction. And what that does is to tell us that it's going to rotate this way. It's going to rotate, um, you know, uh, counterclockwise. So um, the torque here, um, if I write this as a vector, would be um, 1 half L F2 in magnitude, remember, is ILB. Sine of theta is a vector in the x hat direction. Now let's talk about torque 4. Well, here again, if you look at our torque diagram, you put your fingers up R4, you close them towards F4, and you have a thumb that again is down the positive x hat direction. So it's going to be the same you see what's happening here is the the up and down forces are causing the loop to want to rotate like this and what that does is to align the, 
the, the face of the loop, okay, align this length of the loop perpendicular to the direction of the magnetic field. Okay, now we're going to talk about that here in a moment. Now let's talk about torque 3 and torque 1. Those are pretty easy, and that's because if you look at our front view picture, torque 3 and torque 1 are both due to F1 and F3. They act through the center right here. Now how far away is the center from the center? It's the length of zero. And so torque one and torque three, because R in both cases is equal to zero, is zero as well. So um, torque one is equal to torque three is equal to zero. So at the end of the day, the only uh, parts of this current flow that produces uh, force in the presence of this magnetic field that matter to us with respect to giving us a non-zero torque would be the top and the bottom parts, the ones that go in and out of the page. Now, uh, so when you sum up your torque here to get the net torque, which I'll just call tau, it's going to be tau 2 plus tau 4. They're both the same. They are both have a half in front, which means when you add them together, you get I times L squared times B times sine of theta x hat. Now L squared is the area. Okay, so you know another way this is written is I times A times B times sine of theta x hat. Now let's talk about um, the, the angle here. So the angle that you would be dealing with uh, would be this one right here if you look at our side view. Okay, now I want you to imagine for a moment um, this loop as a area that sits out in space that has a normal. So if I were to draw the normal here, considering the direction of B as being, we'll say, in the positive direction, out, this would be the direction of the normal, and this angle right here and this angle right here would be the same. Okay, so one way you can think of this torque is that it would be this n hat cross b from a directional standpoint which will give you the same thing as L cross F. That's what this angle is, same angle in between. Okay. So, torque here is generally written as I times A times N hat cross B and I A N hat falls under the guise of something called mu vector or the magnetic moment. Okay. In general, mu vector is equal to n i a times n hat. The n here would be if you were instead of dealing with one loop, you were dealing with more than one loop, so current. Each loop is going to give you a, an equivalent amount of torque. So this would be the number of loops of current. Okay, so this is your magnetic moment, um, and it's incredibly useful uh, when you talk about uh, magnets and stuff um, producing uh, effects on loops of current. And we'll also see it also uh, rears its head when you when you deal with interaction between magnets as well. So uh, mu cross b, like that. So so when you use this particular formula. Um, one thing that will help you sort of identify the direction of the magnetic moment is to take your fingers and sort of rotate them around in the direction of the currents flowing around the loop. So for example, if you were to look at the front view image here, 
than if you took your right hand and you rotated your fingers around I, your thumb is going to point straight out towards you, uh, in this case straight down the y-axis. And, uh, and in general that's the way we think about the direction of mu. So the magnetic moment, if you just do your little finger curl trick, your thumb is going to give you the direction of the magnetic moment. And like for example here, on the side view, if I um, stuck my fingers and sort of rotated them around um, from, we'll say where F2 is at the very bottom, put my fingers in and let them rotate up to where it comes out, you'll see my thumb points in exactly the same direction as in hat. So, so that said, um, what I'd like to do now is to talk about energy. Since we have a torque present, which is the rotational analog of force, we can talk about the energy that um, is present in there uh, that, that can do work on, say, our loop. Because obviously if you're reorienting this thing, uh, for example, in this case, you would be, you know, uh, the torque would act to take and bring my loop here in line with the z-axis. Okay, if you think about the magnetic field being down the y-axis, like uh, in the previous example, then, you know, obviously there's work being done. So, um, so that said, um, if you uh, remember way back when, uh, in University of Physics 1, when we talked about rotational motion, uh, work, and torque, um, this right here is the equation for it. Now, this, this is a dot product right here, and I'd like to remind you that you know, as done, uh, typically the torque here and the direction of positive theta would be the same. But here, if we start with an initial angle, we'll say of theta, and a final angle of uh, zero, as this thing orients itself straight like that, then what you're doing is you're going in the minus theta direction. So what that does when you uh, look at the torque and you look at the direction of d theta is something that you would integrate over is to put a minus sign out in front. Okay. Now torque itself from a magnitude standpoint, because this is a magnitude, looks like mu times b times sine of the angle in between. That's the angle right here. So uh, if I were to integrate both sides putting this in, my work would be minus mu times b, since those are constants. We have a constant current and we have a uniform magnetic field. And then you're integrating uh, sine of theta d theta uh, from our initial angle, which we'll call theta, uh, to zero, which is where it's lined up. So um, the integral of sine is minus cosine. The minus kills this minus off, which makes this uh, mu times b times cosine of theta. And then uh, we're going to evaluate it from uh, theta to zero, which would be mu uh, b times one minus cosine of theta. So as you can see, positive work is being done because cosine of theta is always equal or less than one, which means that um, you know uh, positive work. Well, if you have work, that means that you have potential energy. So uh, we know work is equal to minus the change in potential energy. Okay, which would be minus uh, mu minus mu naught. On the right hand side, if I multiply this through, we have mu b minus mu b cosine of theta. And uh, and so so here, um, you know, if your final potential energy mu naught is going to be related to this, your initial potential energy. So here, this is related to your final potential energy, and this is related to your initial potential energy. So if you, um, if you link the two anywhere in between, there's going to be this cosine of theta factor there. A minus times a minus is a plus, which means my potential energy here is equal to minus mu b cosine of theta. Now, that cosine you can use to turn this into a dot product because we know, um, you know, a dot b is equal to a b 
times cosine of the angle in between. And here the angle is between the direction of out here and B. So this is the same thing as minus mu dot B. Okay, so, so now we have the potential energy here, and we also have an equation for the torque. So let's do an example. So uh, here we have an electron that's placed uh, in a magnetic field of 1.2 tesla. If the angle between the magnetic moment of the electron and the field is 25 degrees, and the moment of the electron is 9.28 times 10 to the minus 24th joules per tesla, what is the torque felt by the electron and the potential energy in this orientation? Now, you can think of an electron roughly as a little sphere of charge that spins in place. That's not entirely correct. Uh, as we're going to discover um, as the class progresses, um, electrons are incredibly magnetic. You can treat them as little loops of current that have an associated magnetic field. So um, this, uh, this electron has a magnetic moment. Okay. So we want to know what the torque is and what the potential energy is in this orientation. So um, we're going to draw us a little picture here, much like what we had before. Um, here's my electron. I'm going to draw my electron um, as a loop of current, like that. Here's the direction of out for my loop of current, we'll say. This angle right here is... Um, 25 degrees. We'll say this is the direction of B, which is 1.2 Tesla. Uh, if I call this Z and I call this Y, uh, Y hat. And, uh, you know, uh, the direction of normal, like I said, is that way. So that's the direction of mu as well. I mean, not the mu. Anyway, um, so, so here, the torque and magnitude uh, is going to equal to mu times b times sine of theta. And we're given um, everything we need. Our angle and our magnetic moment. Okay. So, so here the torque is pretty easy to do in magnitude. Is going to be uh, you know 9.28 times 10. That should be minus 24th, I believe. Let me double check that. It doesn't look quite right. So let's take a look. Yeah, minus 24th. Um. Here we go, 9.28 times 10 to the minus 24th joules per tesla um, times the magnetic field, which is 1.2 tesla, um, times sine of the angle in between. Uh, that is 25 degrees. And if you do the math here, times 1.2 times sine 25. Um, the torque here is 4.7 times 10 to the minus 24th. Um, it's written as joules here, um, but a joule is a newton times a meter, and if you remember the units of torque, it's typically newton meters. So um, from a directional standpoint, Let's use the right-hand rule. So um, it's uh, mu cross b. I point my fingers in the direction of the normal mu, close them towards b, which would be along y. And what I have is a thumb that's into the board. Um, into the board is uh, the minus z hat direction, or minus x hat rather. There. So how much energy is here? 
Well, uh, my initial potential energy would be uh, minus mu dot b. Uh, 9.28 times 10 to the minus 24th uh, joules per tesla. Uh, B, 1.2 tesla. Uh, the sine of the angle in between, or cosine rather of the angle in between. So, uh, just real quick. Uh, this ends up being about 1.0 times 10 to the minus 23rd joules. Now, you'll notice there's a negative sign out in front. Uh, in truth, the electron's mag magnetic moment is negative. It has to do with um, the the fact that the electron is a negative charge and uh, the, the way the spin behaves. So um, we'll put a minus sign here, but just be aware that if you were to actually look up um, the electron magnetic moment, um, it would be negative. And um, you can see it here. Uh, let me add another page here so you can see. Uh, here and then uh, this is just from a wiki page so you can see um, it's a negative magnet moment All right okay so um, the very last thing I want to talk about is something called the Hall effect I just want to mention it um, because uh, it is something that pops up in uh, various areas of physics uh, and, and possibly also um, in uh, electricity and electronics. Um, so I want you to think of a conductor carrying uh, current like this. So here's your, your tube carrying current, if you will. We'll say your current's going this way. And, um, you know, let's pretend that we have a magnetic field uh, we'll say um, that's coming out of the board towards us, like this. So maybe this is the direction of B right here. Uh, coming out, like this. Now, uh, this right here would be the direction of the current, and hence uh, the direction of the drift velocity, or if you want to think of it, the direction of... Uh, I vector or I times L, depending upon how you want to uh, sort of think about it. Now, um, here, uh, we know that there's going to be a torque. Uh, it's going to be, or not a torque rather, but there's going to be a force. That's going to look like QV cross B on the electrons as they flow through, right? So um, if you do V cross B here uh, using your fingers, um, you end up with uh, a downwards force on the electrons as they go through. When you take into account the charge of the electron, it ends up being upwards. So what that actually does is to cause the electrons as they drift through to have a little bit of an upwards velocity. And what they do is they have a tendency to collect right here as they pass through. Okay. So this is the Hall effect, because if they collect up this way, thinking of conductors as being you know, sort of electrically neutral things, you end up with uh, positives down here. Okay. And um, now we have inside a wire um, a region of negative, a region of positive, which means that you can talk about the electric field that sits in between. Okay. So what you have here is basically a Lorentz force that's a consequence of the fact that you're moving charge through and you have a magnetic field that's present. Now, uh, Hall actually used this to identify the sign of the charge carrier in wires. So uh, it was thanks to the Hall effect that we knew that in truth it was the electrons that were transporting charge and not uh, the protons or anything positive on the inside. So, um, you know, just be aware that this Hall effect can, can, can rear its head and what it does is to sort of almost create this velocity selection effect as it goes through. But it also creates regions of polarization inside your conductor 
uh, that you can use to uh, to do diagnostics on it. So again, this is a Hall effect. We may see it later. All right, so that's it for video two, and uh, I'll see you in the next chapter.